From the campus of Yale University, this is Business Talk with Jim Campbell, nationally syndicated across the country on the Biz Talk radio network and coming to you from our flagship stations, Yale Radio WYBC and 1490 AM WGCH Greenwich. All talk and all business, 60 minutes of radio with leading figures from the world of business along with the business of politics and sports. Stagnating economies, the rise of populist nationalism, threatening disintegration, income inequality, demographic challenges, anti-immigration pressures, dysfunctional gridlock politics, the fate of the West hangs in the balance. That's today on Business Talk with Jim Campbell. We've got Bill Emmett. He was the editor-in-chief of The Economist magazine, currently chairman of educational charity uh, called the Wake Up Foundation, a trustee of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, and a visiting professor at Suzitsu University in Japan. His new book just out, The Fate of the West, The Battle to Save the World's Most Successful Political Idea. Welcome from Dallas, Bill. I'm delighted to be with you, Jim. you got a Brit down in South. i got to tell you, um, as even as a young kid, my dad used to get The Economist. I used to look at it. And it always sort of blew me away that the economists seem to have better insight on the U.S. than we did from internally. Well, that's a fabulous compliment. I'm uh, flattered uh, about The Economist. I left it uh, 10 years ago uh, because uh, my time was up. But uh, I'm proud, immensely proud, to have worked there for 25 years. Okay. um, How serious, as we start off with the big picture, uh, how serious is the trouble the West is facing and where is it coming from? In my view, it's politically serious. Uh, It's serious in the sense that we are at a kind of tipping point where uh, the the problems we have have the potential, uh, and I stress the word potential rather than currently actuality, of tipping the West into a kind of downward spiral, a downward spiral of uh, poor economic performance, uh, but also of political fragmentation, fractiousness, division, uh, sort of disintegration of some of the Western fundamentals, networks that we've had um, over the last uh, really 75 years since uh, World War II. Why? Essentially because of the legacy of the 2008 financial crisis. Mm -hmm. Ten years ago, but still not really resolved, stagnant real incomes, angry people, people feeling they've been left behind by all sorts of trends, globalization, technology, and others, but most of all, really thumped hard uh, in the solar plexus by the 2008 financial crisis and feeling mad about it, and therefore susceptible to new ideas that could nevertheless be bad ideas, particularly ones that might close borders, close mines, and take away some of the fundamentals of our uh, prosperity. Uh, I sense a little bit of uh, President Trump in those comments. Um, country civilizations rise and fall. There's sort of an arc. Um, are we in a permanent decline, or you think we're going to be able to be the, the guys that beat the normal declines of uh, country civilizations? Nothing is inevitable. I don't believe in the in the sort of belief in the thought of you know, cycles that uh, have a kind of destiny to them. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, we in the West are capable, unfortunately, of going into decline, but we have the possibility to uh, escape it. And why? Because we have open societies, the liberal democracies that we've built, have, to me, the brilliant capacity of adaptation and evolution. Uh, Adaptation to circumstances, evolution in response to problems that may last quite a long time, but then we find our ways out of them by uh, finding new ideas. The brilliance of the Western idea to me, is that balance between openness, which drives us on to new things, brings in new people, brings in new ideas, brings in new opportunities, and a sense of equality between us all as citizens. And what I mean by equality is that we feel that we are all participants, that we're all citizens, that we all have an equal political voice, as was laid down in the U.S. Constitution two centuries ago, an equal political voice uh, in um, how things are done and why things are done and what happens next. Do you as long think as we maintain those two things? I think we can get out of it. Okay. Um, do you think is President Trump's election an outgrowth of this din- discontent? Forty years of stagnant uh, wages, and with that, the Brexit move uh, versus Macron beating Le Pen is, is the, which is the balance tipping uh, uh, back to normalcy, or how do you put this all together? Uh, I believe that. Uh, 
Donald Trump's election last November, also the 30% share of the vote that Marine Le Pen, the far-right candidate in France, achieved in their presidential election uh, last month, and some elements of Brexit are uh, signs of uh, canaries in the coal mine. They're signs of the anger and alienation of citizens. Uh, in the case of Trump and Le Pen, anger and alienation that, that leads citizens to be tempted by uh, recipes that I believe would be um, deleterious, would be damaging. But nevertheless, people like Donald Trump are reflecting genuine grievances and genuine anger. They need to be listened to because they've got the right questions, even if they've got the wrong answers. Let's uh, talk about, those are internal threats, which I think is what you think is, is the main driver. But let's look at some uh, external uh, threats. Uh, Putin's uh, interfering in elections, the Ukraine, Crimea. How big a threat is he in a, in a, in a longer term basis? I think that Putin and his uh, system in Russia is quite a big systematic threat. He's not a threat in the way that the Soviet Union was of offering an alternative and operating on a global basis, uh, trying to provoke a conflict of all kinds. But he is uh, someone who believes that a weak West is good for him uh, and a strong West is bad for him. And he's doing his best to try to undermine our institutions. He's trying to undermine the European Union and NATO. And he did, I believe, interfere in your election last uh, fall. Uh, so if somebody is really determined to do that, even at huge cost to himself, that makes him quite a big threat. Okay, China now. There's a, They were on track to surpass the U.S. in GDP in, say, 2030. Uh, how about China as a threat? Well, I believe China is a huge challenge. Uh, I don't necessarily see it as a threat, but uh, the rise of um, what is, in any uh, sense of the word, a, a superpower, uh, the rise of a new superpower always challenges the existing uh, or the status quo. Uh, and I believe China's growth is should be welcomed in economic terms. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, with a 1.3 billion population of vast territory and a, a history of uh, being a dominant power in its region, China has expectations uh, of a status in the world that uh, is going to propose a challenge. It really wants to have equal status to the United States um, and have the same sort of position as the United States of helping to set the rules of the game without necessarily um, being subject to them itself. Uh, and that, when you one, one power that uh, we trust, which is the case with the United States, with that kind of position is all very well, but having two may be quite destabilizing. So that's the threat of China, uh, or the challenge of China. Okay, uh, ISIS and the rise of terrorism, the disintegration of the Middle East, if you will. Well, ISIS, ISIS and its terrorism, particularly its terrorism uh, in our cities in Europe and, uh, and Al-Qaeda in the cities of the United States and potentially in the future, is a, ter a terrible a phenomenon. Um, I believe it's a phenomenon that we can contain. Uh, that needs our uh, vigilance, our strong security measures against it. But uh, I believe it's, uh, it's it's not a systemic threat to us in um, in any sense, but uh, clearly it's a battle that we've got to fight. Um, I think that we're winning the fight, or we and the, and the forces of stability are winning the fight in the Middle East against ISIS, but it has a lot of followers uh, in Europe uh, and, uh, I guess, in the United States, uh, and we need to win their hearts and minds and persuade them that uh, blowing up people or killing people in the streets of London or Berlin or Paris is not the way to go about things. And um, that, th that that challenge is uh, still underway. Okay, we've got about a minute and a half in this segment. Bill, does the West have the sense of urgency necessary to overcome these decline, decline threats, or do we need some sort of a crisis uh, beyond what we have now? I think a year ago I would have said no. I would have said that uh, the West, and particularly its elites, were quite complacent. We'd had some recovery from the crash. Uh, things were ticking along, but slowly. Now the election of Donald Trump, the challenge to Marine Le Pen, Brexit, these kinds of phenomena are wake-up calls, and I think people are waking up. Uh, the phenomenal uh, success in France of a moderate reformist new party led by this 39-year-old new president yeah. is a sign that we're waking up. 
You're listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell over the Business Talk Radio Network, 350 stations around the country. You can go to biztalkradio.com, find the station closest to you, listen over the Internet, access our podcast. Coming next, we'll look into some of the specific uh, challenges the West faces. So stay with us. We're back with former Economist Magazine Editor-in-Chief, uh, Bill Emmett. And I um, want to ask you, uh, we look into some of these factors that are that are underlying the decline, but I'll start at the national level first. What, why can't Japan, after 50 years, turn it around? When I was at IBM right out of business school, the, the executive team was convinced that Japan was the biggest competitive threat to IBM, not an individual country. And they built a strategy on taking a country. What happened? Well, I think that um, uh, Japan really proved too rigid. Its society um, and its organizational structure, the way companies work, uh, seemed to be uh, uh, its great advantage when competing with, uh, with companies like IBM or with, uh, with um, RCA or with, uh, or with uh, General Motors. The coherent nature of organizations, social stability, group mentality seemed to be a great advantage in the 1970s and 1980s. I went out there as a correspondent uh, and lived there for several years in the 1980s. Uh, And yes, Americans particularly saw Japan as the future. But in fact, what happened was that the the system got rigid, interest groups got too powerful, uh, companies refused to change, weren't innovating enough. The result, as a substitute, was an enormous credit bubble that then produced a, a crash in 1990, from which the country hasn't recovered because it hasn't found ways to recreate flexibility and innovation uh, in society. It's, it's a lovely place. It's a wonderful place, but it's no longer uh, the champion of the world. Interesting. All right, let's look at some of these big challenges. Uh, the affordability of welfare, unfunded pensions, people living longer, the whole working uh, age issue. Your thoughts? Well, my thought about uh, demography, about uh, the aging of our societies, is that uh, this is a wonderful outcome of uh, health and life, life expectancy that we can expect to live longer than particularly our grandparents could expect to. But it means that we've got to rethink the way uh, we plan our working lives uh, and the way in which we pay our taxes and draw our uh, benefits. Uh, and one of the difficulties today is that, um, thanks to the affluence of the 1960s and 1970s, when great society program in the U.S. or uh, great uh, expansions of welfare states in Europe were established, then we made promises that people could retire at a certain age, draw a pension, from, the, from often from the government, especially in Europe, uh, for the rest of their lives, not expecting that the rest of their lives would last 30 or 40 years in some cases, so that we've got to adjust that. We've got to work longer, um, which probably means you know, often with part-time work and with different phases in our lives, maybe until we're 70 or 75, uh, and we've got to start drawing public pensions later. That's a difficult adjustment to make, but it's not an impossible one. Uh, if you compare Japan and Italy, uh, just to take two extreme examples, in Japan, the over 65s, many of them are in the workforce. More than 20% of the over 65s uh, still work, whereas in Italy it's only 4%. And that's all to do with the pension systems. If we can crack that, we can at least make the public finances work. Um, and then technology. I need a robot to work with me as I get older. I'm 61 years old now. Hmm. By the time I'm 70, I think I want some technology to help me out. <laughs> Um, A big one, income inequality, and uh, you cite here, too, that uh, the CEO's pay to workers uh, ratio is 350 to uh, to 1 in the U.S., 50 to 150 in Europe. Um, Thomas Piketty has, you know, said that the return on investment on capital is going to exceed that of uh, income growth, which will further widen it. Um, Is there something we can do? Because this is obviously a source of a lot of the unrest. I believe it is a source a lot of a lot of the unrest, and I think one reason it's a source of that is a sense of injustice, feeling that this, that it's not fair uh, in many cases that this happens, but particularly a feeling that it's not been fair since the 2008 financial crisis, and a perception that, if you like, bankers and the wealthy 
have been able to protect themselves while the, uh, the um, ordinary folk, uh, particularly in uh, former industrial zones, the Rust Belt, um, have uh, borne the, the brunt of things. So an unfairness is at the root of it, but also then inequality is a problem because it uh, is becoming entrenched. You know, have, if you have money, then your children are much li- more likely to be able to get into a good university, uh, are much more likely to be able to get the advantages in life that then takes away the ladder of social mobility that is the fundamental of the American dream. What can we do about it? Um, I believe that we need to, uh, first of all, remedy some of the inequalities in the political system that comes from wealth, i.e. deal with campaign finance uh, and uh, deal with uh, the way in which billionaires are able to buy their way through politics. But secondly, refocus public resources, particularly towards uh, the broadening of education, just as we did in the past through the GI Bill in the U.S. and similar measures in the U.K., uh, and reinvest in state colleges and state universities to make sure that the ladder of mobility is there. And finally, uh, I do believe in measures to raise the uh, state, the federal minimum wage uh, to help people at the lower end, the most vulnerable end of the income bracket. Uh, California and New York and some other states are doing it themselves, raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Um, I think that needs to be done on a nationwide basis in the United States um, in order to reduce some of that sense of injustice. Okay, uh, labor markets. Now, you, you compared Japan and Italy. Uh, I was interested in, in Denmark, um, what, what uh, is called flex security. Talk about uh, what they've done. What the Danes have pioneered, and that's been echoed in other parts of Scandinavia and uh, other people are trying to do it, is to... Uh, combine um, a sort of reduction in the protections that uh, that employees have in in, in, the, uh, in their jobs in the labor force in other words that, they are, that employers have got an increased right to hire and fire but alongside that have offered uh, government funded um, uh, organizations and uh, and uh, incentives to help people to retrain to adjust to economic change so that when a steel company uh, closes because of Chinese competition or, uh, or a textile firm uh, mill closes, uh, the government moves in and uh, spends a serious amount of money helping people um, re-equip themselves for, uh, for a new career and a new life. Uh, that's not a new idea, but it's the, it's the seriousness of the package uh, that combines that flexibility and the assistance to find new things that's really worked well. Scandinavia. And now the new president of France, Emmanuel Macron, is talking about doing the same thing in France. It it would seem like it'd be something that we really could use over here. Um, In our last minute or so, the, uh, you know, President Trump's talked about a travel ban, the wall, uh, NATO's obsolete, the TPP should uh, be abandoned, climate change. Um, Are are, are these wrong interpretations of the uh, uh, unrest? Um, your, your mind? I, I believe they are wrong interpretations of, of the unrest. I believe that uh, it's always tempting at times of unrest to blame foreigners, to blame outsiders anyway. Uh, blame outsiders to your community or blame outsiders to your country. Uh, and blaming them as immigrants, blaming them as foreign countries, blaming them as foreign competitors uh, is tempting because foreigners don't vote. Uh, but I think that uh, while well, there's all sorts of things can be improved in these international arrangements. Mm-hmm. Those are not the problem. The real problems are internal. You're listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell from our flagship stations, WGCH Greenwich and Yale Radio, WYBC. We're going to take a tour around the Western world next. We're here with Bill Emmett. He's got a new book, The Fate of the West, The Battle to Save the World's Most Successful Political Ideas. We're going to go through some of the countries now and see what kind of tune-ups they could benefit uh, from. And I want to start with the uh, United States here. And I guess at base, you could say that going from a 3.3 uh, average growth rate above 3% to 2% for now 15, 20 years um, is why everything is stagnated. What are some of the things that we can do in the U.S. to re- to revive ourselves. You have ideas starting even with breaking up the banks. So go ahead. 
Well, I believe that the situation in the U.S. today is quite analogous to that at the turn of the 20th century when Theodore Roosevelt was your president, uh, and he broke up Standard Oil. He was known as a trust buster. He was ending, as he saw it, a uh, period the gilded age of capitalism and dealing with what he called malefactors of great wealth. And I believe that is necessary. Uh, again, in the U.S., monopoly power has increased industrial consolidation in all sectors, including technology, um, has increased, and that's uh, taking away competition, taking away competitiveness, and the banks have become disproportionately large. So I think one of the remedies is um, a new Teddy Roosevelt trust-busting period. But secondly, also, um, infrastructure, I believe, uh, is a, a, an absolutely important uh, measure. Uh, there, uh, President Trump, uh, in his campaign at least, was correct that uh, U.S. infrastructure used to be the envy of the world, and now it's been under underspent on, underinvested in for several generations, uh, and uh, that really needs to be improved in order to um, enable companies to produce and compete um, on a on a globally um, globally viable basis. Politics now, um, you talk about the, uh, the gerrymandering that have essentially built a duopoly between the Republicans and Democrats, which moves everybody to the extremes. Uh, what do we do about our political gridlock? Well, the difficulty with the political gridlock is that the people who need to decide are the parties themselves, the ones who have benefited from it. Uh, and uh, that, uh, I, must, uh, I must confess, is a, is a very difficult uh, gridlock to break. But I do get some hope from uh, looking at um, what's happened in uh, recent years in California, where a terrible gridlock combined with the ballot initiative system that essentially sent the state bankrupt uh, under um, you know under successive governors. It wasn't necessarily their fault, Governor Schwarzenegger and Governor Davis. Um, in the last few years, there's been a bipartisan effort to um, reform this system uh, and to change the referendum, the ballot initiative system, so that it didn't always favor spending more money and, and, and lowering taxes and raising debts, and also to uh, produce new agreements on how uh, to spread the tax base and so forth. That's been helped by Governor Jerry Brown being an experienced governor, also one who's perhaps at a time of his life when he doesn't any longer have presidential ambitions. But California have managed it. What you, we really need, what you really need in this country is some bipartisan commissions in order to uh, achieve this sort of goal. And maybe civil society can put pressure on um, uh, the, the two major parties to try to do that and make them feel that it's uh, in their benefit to uh, solve this problem. Are you optimistic about that kind of an idea, given our short-term framework here? And Simpson Bowles almost built a, uh, um, you know, a restructuring approach, but then didn't go anywhere. I'm not optimistic in the short term, but I believe that over the next five years, uh, there's more potential for it. I think with uh, Simpson Bowles, it was it was just on the cusp and it just failed. Yeah. Uh, if uh, if if you've had sort of a rebellion against the system as powerful, and the political system, I mean, as powerful as that of on the one side Bernie Sanders, um, in the Democrats, and on the other side uh, Donald Trump, both of them. Uh, saying that the system is rigged and that the swamp needs to be drained and all of these phrases, hmm. I think that tells you that there's something of a force for reform, even if the immediate prospects for it aren't good. I think that over the next five years, uh, I think uh, I'm optimistic that something can happen. Okay, we move to Europe now. I'm, uh, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld famously referred to old Europe and European paralysis. And uh, interesting statistic you show, 25% of the global DP, uh, GDP is generated by Europe, but they have 50% of the global social spending. Um, let's start with the, uh, the EU. Uh, is, is, it, is it on the verge of collapse? Do we need, is the currency going to collapse? Do we need multiple currencies? You talk about the uh, EU going from 15 to 28 countries, making consensus even harder. Start with the integration issue. I think that the European Union has got into a state of gridlock, really, a state of dysfunction related to a long period of economic underperformance, which the euro currency was intended to be part of the uh, solution to, but which, thanks to the 2008 financial crisis, the euro single currency became a kind of debtor's prison, a real a source of rigidity, uh, not 
bringing the European Union close to collapse, but rather stopping it ever from going forward. I think that we're now in a position five, six years since the Euro financial crisis really began that some of the most powerful countries in Europe have the will to try to break this paralysis. So I'm newly optimistic about the prospects for Europe uh, because I think that uh, after such a long stagnation and long period of high unemployment among young people, especially in southern Europe and in France, there's a will for change and for collaboration between the nations of Europe, particularly between France and Germany. With a new president elected in France uh, on a massive uh, um, landslide victory, uh, the youngest French president uh, or French leader since Napoleon, I think that there is now the possibility that the European Union could turn constructive and positive rather than being a drag on um, progress in Europe as it's been in recent years. Now, there's a migrant crisis, and I also think there, you know, on the business there's an innovation crisis when Israel generates uh, more technology than all of Europe together. Um, what do you think about the migrant crisis uh, and, and then the technology or the innovation crisis? Well, I believe that the migrant crisis is, uh, yes, a very much an externally generated uh, huge challenge for Europe to deal with. Uh, you know, the Mediterranean in Roman times was considered to be the European sea, the center of the European world. Uh, in recent decades, it's become the sea uh, 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 of the other side of which uh, dangers have lied, have lain, and now because of the civil war in Syria and the collapse of the regime in Libya and uh, other problems in the Middle East, we've got migration flowing uh, across it. I think that this is uh, a long-term challenge. There's no simple solution to it. It's divided European countries against each other uh, because, of, because of the difficulty of facing up to it. But it's bringing us together now, or at least the continental Europeans together, in terms of forming a proper European defense plan, uh, collaborating more with our uh, navies in the Mediterranean to, to intercept people smuggling and, uh, and the migrant flows. Uh, so I think that there is some uh, silver linings to this cloud, but it's not going to go away because the population in, in Africa is growing fast uh, and the pressure for migration is going to still be there. So we've got to manage it just as the United States has had to manage, sometimes successfully, sometimes less so, the flow of migrants from uh, Central and South America. So how, how do, not, innovation, yeah. Yeah, innovation. Uh, I, be, I absolutely agree with you, Jim, that, uh, that Europe's uh, big failure uh, in the recent decades has been poor innovation. I think it's to do with the rigidity of our uh, business systems, of our economies, that has uh, developed really during the 1980s and 1990s which has uh, limited the number of startups, made it, made it difficult to create new big companies to rival the established companies. We've had innovation. Skype was invented by a combination of Estonians and Swedes, but then, for example, but then bought by Microsoft and uh, like, uh, developed in the United States. If we can make our economies less rigid uh, by re deregulation, by uh, liberalization, perhaps led, I hope, by the new president in France, then I think we can start a more beneficial cycle of, of, of innovation. Sweden has succeeded in that small country to do that, um, really during the 1990s and now with companies like Spotify and music streaming and, and others. Uh, I think we need that on a grander scale across Europe, uh, and deregulation and reform are what's necessary to achieve it. All right, our last minute of this segment, uh, you, you went through how um, Margaret Thatcher shook up uh, Britain economically. You say they need now a, a commensurate political shake-up. What do you mean exactly? Well, first of all, how did Margaret Thatcher shake up Britain? She busted interest groups. She was a Teddy Roosevelt of our time uh, in the 1980s, and her target was the trade unions. What Britain needs now is a political, bust, a political uh, shake-up because we are very fragmented uh, between our political parties. We've had a political system that's a uh, first-past-the-post winner-takes-all system, which has led quite a lot of people to feel disenfranchised and loss of a voice uh, and produced a sense of the left behind, that who have no 
political offer being given to them. I think we need uh, to reform our electoral system to uh, encourage a wider sense of representation, uh, some new parties that would represent some of the left behind in our society. Interesting. We'll be back with our final national segment, The Fate of the West. We're speaking with Bill Emmett, former editor of The Economist, and uh, we'll start with the big question. Uh, give us your sense, what is the fate of the West, and, and where's the decisive leadership we need? We don't seem to have Churchill's, uh, FDRs, things like that, guys like that hanging around right now. I think the fate of the West is at, a, is at a, something of a tipping point, um, a tipping point between the regenerative capacity of our democracies and our open societies and alternative ideas of closing borders and mines that have become increasingly tempting to some parts of our populations, as shown by the election of uh, Donald Trump in America and the substantial but fortunately not decisive support for people like far-right leader Marine Le Pen in France. I believe the fate of the West is in the hands of uh, citizens, of businesses, uh, and of political parties to maintain or restore the key balance between openness that stimulates us to new things, new ideas, and a feeling of equality in our societies. It doesn't mean income equality in a socialist sense. It means a sense of broad citizen participation on an equal basis of political rights. I think that reform can be done. I think that the pressure for it is there. I think that uh, in Europe, finally, after long periods of stagnation, we're seeing uh, dramatic uh, new developments, such as in France, uh, where a new party has swept to power, formed only one year ago, uh, and now with a with a reformist program. Um, I think we can, we are capable of doing that, but we've got to understand the seriousness of the issues and the principles of openness and equality uh, that really made us the prosperous, extraordinarily lucky uh, generation that we are. Do we need a, a decisive leader of Margaret Thatcher? Do, you, do we need somebody like that to emerge, or is this something that we need to just build incrementally? I believe we do need, in many countries, uh, decisive leadership. What sort of decisive leadership is crucial, however. It's a leader who is willing to take risks and uh, do big things, as Margaret Thatcher was, but also leaders who can unify, mm -hmm. who can be bipartisan, who can create a consensus. Margaret Thatcher wasn't always good at that, although she, she had to say the least. But uh, she did uh, reach across, if you like, the class divide in Britain and uh, create uh, a consensus in favor of, of many reforms among more working class people. Uh, and I think that that's what the leaders of today need to do. And now we wait to see in France whether Emmanuel Macron will be that leader. Frankly, I don't rule out entirely the possibility that... Uh, a maturing, learning President Trump could uh, do some of those things. But yes, uh, there's, yeah. no, there's not much sign of it now, but uh, only six months in, it's too, too early to judge. Um, on the equality issue, uh, do we need some kind of a new worker compact, worker contract? And, 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 and linked to that, you call for a reduction in the financial sector itself as a percentage of our, our, our overall uh, economic... Uh... Yes, I believe that... Uh, that on the worker side, I think we need um, a, you know, a unified uh, legal structure in, in our countries for all workers to have the same rights uh, in their contracts um, as each other. That uh, We've had very divided systems in countries like France and Italy and Japan um, and uh, de facto probably also in, in America and Britain. I think we need a unified system, but also, um, crucially, some government intervention at the, at the lowest end of the range. I mean, the federal minimum wage in the U.S. is now 40% lower in real terms than it was um, in the 1960s. Uh, and I think uh, there's a place for minimum wages. They mustn't be overused, but uh, nevertheless, they help to, um, to reduce the inequalities and to protect people at the most vulnerable end of the, of the, of the wage structure. So I think that's necessary. At the top end, I do think that the the uh, huge speculative um, activities of, of the financial sector in the 2006, 2007 on a global basis, with de derivative securities all obscured from the regulators, was being done at the public subsidy, in, at, uh, essentially um, on the public ticket, uh, because we were standing by to rescue things if it all went bust. 
uh, that that's not acceptable. And uh, we do need to restrict some of that massive speculation, but also deal with the problem that banks have become too big to fail, too big to deal with. Uh, and I think they do need to be to be broken up, frankly. Um, you call for boring consistency on economic growth, which I think is a great point. Uh, tell folks what you mean by that exactly. Also, uh, I've, I've noticed this too because I was in IT at one point. We've All the investment that's been made in technology has not produced the commensurate uh, productivity uh, increases, which is how you grow GDP. Well, as far as boring consistency is concerned, what I mean by that is that I think that uh, many of our greatest mistakes um, in the West have been made when we've tried to achieve miracles. We've uh, kind of felt that we could uh, produce, produce spectacular periods of economic growth and throw a lot of fuel on the fire, and that just puts us into trouble. We get booms and busts. We get crashes of the sort that we had in 2008 and that we've had at different times in our, in our uh, lifetime. Um, I think that uh, a steady 2 to 3% growth um, is much more sustainable, and that should be the target for economic policy, not um, uh, suddenly uh, producing dramatic uh, new, new uh, spurts of growth, which could they're never sustainable. As far as uh, technology is concerned, I think that um, the combination of effects of the financial crisis and the Great Recession with continued technology innovation has really delayed and depressed uh, companies' ability to raise productivity or even their incentive to raise productivity. Although we have fantastic innovation in artificial intelligence and in obviously the smartphones we all have in our hands, actually corporate investment, business investment is at uh, historic lows. How can that be increased? Well, I do think infrastructure is going to be an important part of the encouragement of that. Uh, but also getting that boring consistency of economic growth to act as an incentive to companies and a, and a, and a, a, rely, a, a sense of predictability for companies uh, to make capital investments um, in using technology to increase their competitiveness. I believe that can happen. Whether it will happen, we'll have to wait and see. As we're under a minute now. Um, let's put you on the spot. What's the probability in your mind, what percentage that we're going to be able to do this revival, say, over five or ten years? I would say the probability is 65% against a 35% danger that we won't. I feel confident that as long as we're aware of what the problems are and what the issues are, we can do it. Uh, and I believe that we will do it, but I'm just not certain about it. I mean, we need people like us, you and me, Jim, to talk about it, to educate people about it, and political leaders to do the same. I think that can happen. That's a great way to end it. One of the great points you make in the book is that the fate of the West is in our own hands. We tend to think it might be terrorism or China or Russia, but we uh, should be able to control our destiny. It's Bill Emmett we've been speaking in a great interview, and it's a great book, by the way, The Fate of the West, The Battle to Save the World's Most Successful Political Idea. This has been Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Thanks to Bill Emmett. Thanks to our national audience for listening, and we'll see everybody next Sunday on Business Talk with Jim Campbell.